So hello everyone and welcome to, I think it's about, I can't even remember how many LTT COVID webinars we've had, but uh, took a bit of a break during August because some of us in the UK were in on holiday and it's wonderful to see you all back and thank you very much to everybody who has agreed to speak. Today we'll be talking about uh, COVID and the long-term care workforce. Uh, it's it's clearly important uh, and a clearly important issue. We have seen that uh, people who work in this sector have been really at the front of dealing with uh, this uh, enormous uh, challenge to the care sector. And quite often, we have also seen that their well-being, their lives, have been also very severely affected by what's happened. And we've also seen quite a lot of a huge amount of responsibility being placed on them. And uh, we've also seen a lot of the impacts of uh, policies we've had on long-term care in relation to workforce coming now to the fore. And I hope, I think we have a huge amount of lessons to learn from this. And I'm absolutely delighted to have a, a, a really good set of speakers today. Um, we're, we're going to have, um, for all of any of you who are new to these webinars, we're going to have an hour of one presentation after the other. And after that, we're going to have a more free-flowing discussion. Everybody is welcome to contribute. You can write any questions on the chat box. I will be moderating and I will be reading the questions and passing them on to the, the speakers. We'll also have moments where we invite people to speak if they wish to. Uh, so please don't answer questions during the webinar, just put them on the box and we'll keep a list of them. We'll get back to them. So uh, just to make sure you have plenty of time for speakers, let me go straight away to the first one. And I'm delighted that we have Aileen Rockart from the OECD who will be talking about current workforce challenges and policy responses. Thank you very much, Rockart. So you, uh, Aileen, sorry, you have 10 minutes. I'll let you know when you had about two minutes to go just so you're aware. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or actually good uh, morning, everyone. I will uh, share my screen. Uh, here we go. Uh, voilà. Okay, yeah. let's <laughs> uh, I will present today the OCD perspective on current LTC workforce challenges and policy responses. I will speak first about uh, the mortality, uh, the impact on mortality of COVID-19. Then I will present the key structural challenges that are currently exacerbated. And I will finish with an overview of policy responses in European countries. This presentation draws heavily on two OECD publications. Uh, the report, Who Cares? Attracting and Retaining Care Workers for the Elderly, and the forthcoming uh, publication, Health Tech Lens, Europe 2020, to be released in November. So since uh, late January, the COVID-19 has spread around the world. And by mid-June, about 1.9 million cases and over 180,000 deaths were reported across EU and EEA countries and the UK. We know that the elderly are overwhelmingly impacted. 92% uh, of COVID-19 deaths were among those aged over 60, 65, with just over half of these deaths among those aged over 80, 85, on average across 19 countries, European countries. As you can see on the graph uh, on the left-hand side, the share of LTC deaths reached about 50% or more of all COVID-19 deaths in Belgium, France, Ireland, and Sweden. And as you can see on the graph on the right-hand side, uh, the LTC death rate per million people aged over 80 was about 5,600 on average and ranged from almost 1,000 deaths to 14,000 deaths in EU countries. And places of death include LTC facilities, home, uh, but also hospital. And just to give you an example, in France, 27% of all deaths of the LTC recipients living in, in, in LTC facilities occurred in hospital. Uh, the share, this share was 21% in Belgium, 29% in Slovenia. So LTC recipients are overwhelmingly impacted. But of course, LTC workers are also impacted. And I would like to start my presentation, the, the main uh, body of my presentation, with the takeaway. Uh, because my takeaway is that the um, current challenges of the LTC workforce 
uh, reflect the structural challenges um, in terms of number of workers, working conditions, skills, and health risks. As um, let, let's start with the numbers of LTC workers per 100 uh, population aged over 65. In over three quarters of OECD countries, the growth in LTC workers has stagnated or decreased since 2011. And so in 2016 and 2011, the OECD average was about uh, five workers per uh, 100 elderly. And as you can see on this uh, graph, the, the rate is actually below half the OECD average in 13 countries. So the number of workers is not sufficient and in LTC and it will not be sufficient in the future. So in LTC, it's difficult to both attract and retain workers. And as we know, the responses to COVID-19 required to increase the number of workers. So the challenges of developing the workforce became even more crucial. Now, I'd like to spend time on the working conditions uh, because really, why is it so difficult to attract and retain LTC workers? I think that we think that part of the answer is related to, and, and the literature shows that part of the answer is related to working conditions. Low pay predominates, non-standard work is common, like part-time jobs, uh, temporary jobs, uh, shift work. In fact, the average tenure is two years lower in LTC than in the overall workforce. And since the outbreak, longer hours and other additional pressures have been reported. So the challenges related to poor working conditions are not new, they have been exacerbated. Now I want to, I, I would like to take a look at, at skills. Um, because as, as you know, across OECD countries, over 90% of LTC workers are women, over 70% are personal carers. And if you look at the table on the right uh, of the right hand side of the slide, then you see that the educational requirements are actually low in many countries compared with the tasks that they perform daily. Uh, personal cures and nurses don't only provide help with ADLs and IADLs. They also perform monitoring, coordination and safety activities. And here again, the responses to COVID-19 require that workers develop new skills uh, sometimes very quickly, with little time to train adequately, and in short, this inadequacy of skills is a structural characteristic of the workforce uh, that's, that's currently exacerbated. And I would like to present one uh, other key structural challenge before moving to policy responses. Uh, this one is important, it's um, related to physical and mental health. Uh, LDC workers are exposed to physical and mental risk factors at work uh, that can lead to health problems and accidents. And with COVID-19 outbreak, the number of sickness absence increased and became an additional problem. So um, that was the last structural uh, challenge that I wanted to point out. It's uh, really linked to COVID-19. Um, and I would like, um, my next slide will be on policy responses to COVID-19, because countries have, of course, taken steps to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Uh, containment uh, strategies have aimed to limit the spread of infection, even though um, they could challenge continuity of care. And as you can uh, see, there were policy measures implemented in European countries covered restrictions of movement within facilities, access to PPE, expansion of telehealth services, uh, prioritization of testing, and the increase of the workforce. Now, these containment uh, strategies covered both LTC recipients and long-term care workers. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the policy responses related to L the LTC workers. They include uh, prioritized access to PPE. So that was, um, one of the most common measures, we found it in, in 16 countries in a form or, or another. We found um, that it was uh, very common that uh, countries try to recruit additional staff. So it could, staff could come, could um, come from, like countries could call retired uh, workers, yeah. unemployed people who received a very quick their training, or even sometimes the army like in Austria. 
policy responses also include uh, include a bonus to LTC workers, uh, financial compensation, uh, support to LTC workers' families. So most of the time, child child care and when when that when there was this that type of of support, um, ch so child care and schools could remain open for uh, the children of LTC workers. Or uh, any public transport was uh, free of charge. That was also very common. For example, in Hungary, the railway companies were free of charge uh, for LTC workers. And the last uh, type of policy response was related to psychological support, uh, which was mostly uh, um, which was mostly done through dedicated phone lines or hotlines. Two minutes, Eileen. Thank you. Two minutes, perfect. So the so as you see, the these poli well the these policy challenges um, taken recently are not enough to tackle the structural challenges that existed before COVID-19. So moving forward, uh, more can be done. There are avenues to develop further the workforce and very briefly regroup them in four main areas at the UCD, recruitment, retention, productivity, and coordination and prevention. And I'm going to leave you with this. You can read about these four main policy areas in our report, Who Cares? Attracting and Retaining Care Workers. We have also published a number of other reports and some are listed on the slide. I just want to point out that next year we will publish a report dedicated to long-term care systems responses to COVID-19. Voila. Um, please don't hesitate to stay in touch uh, with the OECD. You can find through my contact details. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Merci, Eileen. And uh, we're now going to move to the next slide. We'll save any questions. You can put them on the chat box. I've shared the link to the Who Cares report. And uh, of course, mm -hmm. we're going to send any other links too so the participants can also access. So our next presentation is um, it's a, a multi-country study. And uh, uh, the, the study is COVID-19 hazard pay for long-term care workers. And it's looking at different policy approaches to and I think the, I'm not entirely sure who is going to present, but I've got Amy and Anna and a few others that I contribute as I am the call, but I think Anna, you're waving, so I think you'll be speaking yeah. with you an eight minute warning and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. I think I should be able to. Yeah. Working. Thank you. Everyone can see it and hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to be presenting, but this is a collaborative project. So myself and Maya are going to do the presentation, but I'm going to start. So this is our preliminary sort of findings from our study, which is called Hazard Pay for LTC Workers During COVID-19, a multi-country study of policy approaches. So Eileen did an amazing overview, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, so we can get into detail later on. Um, so I'll skip ahead a bit, but I do want to highlight in this slide, if you look at the last column, just to highlight some stats on Canada, because that's where we're from and we'll focus on the Canadian context, but um, LTC deaths as a percentage of all COVID-19 deaths. So it was 81% in Canada, but that's of May 2025. 20, um, but Canada, the LTC sector was greatly impacted by COVID-19. Um, so yeah, and then Eileen presented some great information here, but there's tons of precarity in the LTC workforce, and this is also true in Canada. So Latest numbers are showing up to 30% of personal support workers or healthcare aides work more than one job to make ends meet because they're generally employed on a casual basis, so they'll have to work at multiple jobs. Um, there's minimal formal education and they're not a regulated health profession. So in Canada, in the long-term care sector, 
personal support workers make about 12 to 24 dollars an hour which is quite low so I think that's something like nine to fifteen dollars USD um and COVID-19 has just highlighted these system level issues facing the long-term care sector. So the purpose of our study was to review policies that have supported the LTC workforce during COVID-19. And these are policies that either recognize the added risk or work to stabilize the LTC workforce. In doing so, we hope to identify both trends and gaps among policy responses. So Maya and I are going to focus on the Canadian context specifically, but we're going to have Li Fei discuss the Australian context. So she's our collaborator from Australia. So I'll leave that to her. But for Canada, um, we've sort of allocated the policy responses into two categories. So hazard payments and incentive payments. And we reviewed public facing policy reports to do so. And we supplemented these findings with verification from key stakeholders in the field when, when this was possible. So I'm gonna begin by discussing hazard payments in Canada. So on April 15th, as part of the COVID-19 economic response plan, the Canadian government announced it would provide up to 3 billion in support to increase the wages of a low income essential workers across the country. However, it was up to the various provinces and territories to determine which workers would be eligible and how much money they would receive. So as expected, there was a lot of variability among how the provinces and territories delivered these wage top ups. So that was in terms of announcements, eligibility, and access to these top ups. So while some provinces and territories in Canada made this wage top up exclusive to those working in health and social care services, others implemented a more general criteria that was inclusive of a broader range of essential services. So I provided some examples here, um, but it was seven out of the 13 provinces and territories in Canada who implemented wage top ups that were exclusive to those in health and social care. So Ontario's temporary pandemic pay is an example of that. But however, I'd like to emphasize that while this was an important policy response, it's not exclusive to the LTC workforce despite their greater risk of contracting COVID-19 in Canada, their lower wages and precarious work arrangements. So though an important policy response, it, it didn't help to stabilize the LTC workforce. Okay, we're gonna move on to incentive payments now. So Maya is gonna join us. We cannot hear you yet, Maya. Can you hear me now? Okay. So as Anna mentioned earlier, the second policy measure that we are interested in are financial incentives that have been implemented in order to stabilize the long-term care workforce. And so stabilization incentives include both retention as well as recruitment strategies. In Canada, the most common financial incentives that have been implemented in order to boost worker retention has been through financially protecting staff that have been affected by the rollout of single site restrictions within the long term care sector. So single site order restrictions are either mandatory or voluntary orders that have been implemented in a province or territory to limit the movement of long term care staff between facilities. And so single site orders has become an important prevention strategy in order to curb the transmission of COVID-19 within the sector. So between March and June 2020, eight provinces in Canada have implemented a mandatory single site order, while two have um, voluntary orders. Uh, next slide, Anna, please. So in some jurisdictions, such as Quebec, Single site work restrictions could not actually be implemented because of the current urgent and critical shortage of long term care workers, which would have been only further exacerbated by movement restrictions. 
So the primary difference between the respective provincial and territorial single site orders implemented across Canada is its scope. So in the majority of cases, the single site orders are inclusive of some or all healthcare facilities. So what this means is that long-term care staff are unable to work in both a long-term care facility and another healthcare, healthcare facility such as acute care. So this again reveals the extent of variability across Canada. Um, next slide, Anna, please. So another um, student of Amy, Zena, actually conducted a study to evaluate the effectiveness of single site orders um, across three Canadian provinces, one of which was Ontario. And so as you can see in this figure, based on the doubling time, it was estimated that by May 13th, roughly 70,000 long-term care members um, would have been infected with COVID-19. So this includes both residents as well as staff. But following the implementation of a single site order on April 22nd, um, there were fewer than 5,000 cases observed by the same date. So this illustrates the effectiveness of single site orders in curbing transmission in long-term care homes, which was its primary intended objective. Uh, next slide, Anna. So the rollout of mandatory single site orders may lead to substantial loss of income among long-term care workers who had previously been employed across multiple sites, often working more than full-time hours to earn a living wage. So the financial implications of single site orders may therefore threaten to destabilize an already precarious workforce during this critical time of long-term care staff, particularly personal support workers, seek higher paid positions in other care facilities such as acute care. So among Canadian provinces and territory, British Columbia has implemented one of the most comprehensive financial policies to stabilize the long-term care workforce. So employees affected by the single site order restriction will be paid the highest wage rate they receive working at another facility. And so what this does is that it reduces the incentive for long-term care employees to seek higher paid positions outside of the sector. On top of this, staff will be able to work their total combined hours at a single site up to 1.3 full-time equivalents, which is more than full-time hours. So BC's framework evidently recognizes that long-term care staff frequently work not only multiple jobs, but they also work more than full-time hours and have proactively accounted for this. So BC's provincial Pardon? Two minutes remaining. So BC's provincial health officer also became the employer of all long-term care staff. Uh, next slide, Anna. So some provinces have not actually um, done anything on the public front in terms of revealing any information regarding the protection of hours worked and wages of long-term care staff affected by the order. Uh, next slide, Anna. So in terms of bonus payments, some jurisdictions have implemented pandemic pay programs specifically for the long-term care workforce, um, such as Alberta, who provides a $2 top-up in order to stabilize the workforce in the long-term care sector. Uh, next slide, Anna. So on top of retention incentives, some provinces use financial incentives to boost recruitment, such as Quebec, which provides a $26 an hour full-time employment contract for um, new health care aides who enter the sector following the completion of a training program. Um, and so we would like to introduce Lee Fay, who will speak to the Australian context in more detail. So Lee Fay is an associate professor in aging and health at the University of Sydney, and she is the lead author of the LTC COVID report for Australia and is collaborating with us on this paper. Hi, thanks, Maya. Um, so as you've already mentioned, Australia um, has put aside 390 million for the retention bonus. Um, that's $800 per quarter for residential aged care workers and it's slightly less for home care workers of $600 a quarter. Um, it's been controversial that this is only for people who uh, are involved in direct care. So it doesn't include laundry staff, uh, cooks, caterers, administration staff. We also had during our second outbreak in Melbourne and Victoria paid pandemic leave. So up to $1,500 one-off payment 
for people, including aged care workers who need to self-isolate because they've been judged a close contact or they're waiting test results. We have uh, voluntary single site operations in Victoria. They're meant to go for eight weeks and the facilities are meant to apply for a grant to support their workers to work you know, full time in their facilities. But my impression from speaking with providers is that they really haven't been completely implemented in terms of really truly doing single site operations. So that's what's happening here in Australia, very briefly. Thank you. Uh, so Adelina, we'll just wrap it up now. <laughs> Yes. We're out of time. And, uh, we can use also the discussion in case you want to, you know, yeah. add anything to it. So thank you. Absolutely. Very much. <laughs> thank you. And um, our next speaker uh, from the UK is uh, Shirin Hussein. And Shirin is going to talk about uh, COVID-19 and UK care workers while being at work, policy and practice implications. Welcome, Shirin. You've got 10 minutes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I will try to be brief in my 10 minutes. Um, I will first give a, um, it is really helpful to have the previous two, two speakers, so Elaine, talking about um, the kind of OECD country experience. And it was really, really helpful to, to also know a little bit more about Canada um, and Australia experience so that was, um, was was quite interesting. So um, just to, to, just to, we all know that to be able to implement any policy the, the, the workforce is a kind of the key, the key agent to deliver that change and to translate the systems to service delivery. So the UK social care system shares very similar characteristics like many of other uh, countries, which is, um, you know, in terms of the working conditions, so I'm not going to speak about that, the, the insecurity of contracts and the low wages. Um, and the profile similarly to other countries is uh, very gender biased, uh, ethnicity and nationality. But perhaps just to highlight the mixed care economy of the UK, so we've got um, the financing of the social care here is quite complex. It is, um, it's not universal. Part of it is uh, state provided or at least funded um, and it's means both needs and means tested but it's more recently becoming uh, very fragmented the delivery itself um, uh, and has a long kind of standing problems with recruitment retention and underfunding and it's really legacy of political neglect to some extent um, in terms of policy, so it was really interesting to see the incentive payment in, in Canada and the protection of kind of a single site order, which uh, has, uh, you know, we, we didn't see anything similar to that uh, here in the UK. So it, it's really, to, it's a very complex assembly of policy since we started the pandemic, particularly for social care. There have been uh, a lot of guidance uh, at different time uh, points and uh, the King's Fund had to do a review in July and their conclusion where there it's very fragmented and many of them came too late. Um, and the, while we started the lockdown, not the, you know, the social measurement, um, social distancing measures and lockdown in March, actually um, the other social care action plan only published in mid April. Um, and then in May, there was some introduction of dedicated fund to fund uh, support to the infection control in care homes. Um, and there was, has been from the beginning challenges in accessing PPE and testing, despite the prioritization of testing of health and care staff. Um, and um, the, the system fragmentations itself made it very difficult to coordinate support. Um, and, and needless to say that there has been differentials in that tension in many in care homes because of the excess death uh, that happened in care homes. So I just wanted to look at the news. I looked at the news since March, and in March, everybody was clapping uh, to, to NHS and social care. Uh, in April, we saw these lovely initiatives from care staff themselves. So some staff have camped on the ground of care homes to make sure there is no infection, a kind of transmission. And in May, uh, we actually started to look at the ONS data and we found out that the care workers death rate was quite high and it, twice, it is twice that of health care workers. And in June, the analysis revealed the, the vulnerability of ethnic minority groups uh, and how um, 
you know, some people said it's because of structural racism, but also uh, cumulative uh, kind of um, health problems. And in uh, July, uh, we, we heard Boris Johnson saying that it's the fault of care homes that they didn't follow procedures. And in fact, there have been reports uh, of um, kind of blaming the care workers for working in more than one site and going to home care and providing, you know, um, you know carrying the disease. Um, and then in August, uh, we had the case that someone was asymptomatic, that what always what we say, that you have to test, test, test. Um, and this care um, had the antibody test to discover that she had coronavirus and she didn't realize it. And she never, she was never tested, she was never offered. So I think this is where the policy and, and reality comes. And just in September, early September, we find a care home care worker who actually had COVID twice. So just to give you the exposure. So I'm going to give you quickly some early findings from a survey, what we call a pulse survey, a very quick online survey uh, that took place recently. And it's part of uh, the retention and sustainability of social care workforce uh, or rescue project that we, uh, it's uh, Florine Baden and myself from the University of Kent that are PIing this. And it's a, um, we've got a, a big team. It's funded by the Health Foundation. It's a collaboration between uh, Kent, UCL, and City. So the, the survey was uh, we we kind of planned it to be quite short, so not to need more than 15, 20 minutes to complete. We ran it for five weeks to get uh, a kind of a feedback of what's happening on the ground, and we received just short of uh, 300. I want to say that it was a bit uh, female, more than the, the average. So the average is around 82%. We have fewer uh, black and minority ethnic group and fewer uh, white men British. We have to divide the nationality and ethnicity because there was quite interesting finding coming from uh, the two. Uh, we also captured um, many of those who have been working for a long time in the sector, which is really interesting. So the views that you will you will have is uh, in the majority from the existing workforce because we had a recruitment drive and volunteer drive. Uh, so we, we only had 2% of uh, those who have been recruited post COVID. Um, and if you look at uh, the contracts we also have people who have been stable in, in, in their contract. So the private sector, um, it's just give you an idea, is the, the over half were from the private sector. Um, we had a good split between uh, nursing and uh, domiciliary care. So I'm gonna go this quickly and I'll, I'll come to the meat of the findings. So um, we asked them as, you know, since, uh, since March and since the onset of COVID, how different things has changed. Um, and uh, over 50%, over 56% said that they increased their working hours, uh, nearly 20% self-isolated. Very few of them have been furloughed. So furloughed, of course, this is um, uh, a measure that has been taken to protect staff and to offer them that they're not coming to work, but they're taking um, majority of the salary, but a lot of the workers are not eligible for that anyway. Um, and we've got 6% uh, stopped work for one reason or the other. And then we ask it if they have been self-isolated or stopped work for other condition, what was the, the source of, of payment or the, the type of payment? Um, so we've got under half got the normal pay uh, and we've got 18% had no pay at all, which is quite interesting. What was interesting when we looked at um, black and minority ethnic group that is a self-isolation rate shot high up to 35%, followed by white non-British, and then it's only 15% among white British, which is really interesting and links very well to the ONS data and the overall data, which actually uh, you know, require us to think more about why this was, has happened, has happened. Um, what, what uh, you know, has been there anything about training, which will come up in some of the next slides. What's, um, we've got, uh, we've asked the um, respondent to write free text and to our amazement really, a lot of people have taken the time to write a lot about their experience during COVID. Um, and this, um, this person says, I was off work sick for five weeks and this is the, the most I have taken uh, off in my whole working career. And I only received stationary sick pay, which is very low. And you can imagine if I live on national living wage, 
uh, living on SSP for five weeks is, is very hard. Two minutes. Two minutes, all right, okay, I have to, to race. <laughs> Okay, I, um, I want to look at this a little bit. I'm not going to read the, um, the codes, but in terms of training, because that's really important, uh, we've got quite a, a fifth of, of respondents felt that they didn't get uh, related COVID-related training. Um, and we've got a, a considerable percentage feeling unsafe uh, or they didn't have clear guidance, they didn't have enough PPE. And again, the, the differentials uh, by ethnicity was, uh, was quite striking. And there was a general feeling that, that they have been failed by the government. Um, what was also clear that their general health, um, you know, kind of 47% felt that the general health got a bit or, or a lot worse and quite considerable percentage felt they were more depressed and they're more feeling of tense, uneasy or worried. Um, a lot of that was linked to PPE or um, just how to function. There was a lot of worries for managers. Uh, Living carers have to stay with, uh, with their, their uh, older person or the person that they care for for a long period of time, which impacted um, uh, on them. Um, in terms of other things that has changed, other aspects, uh, what was interesting that uh, you know, job safety has de declined and workload has increased. Um, and again, um, there is a feeling of completely being let down um, and, and the unavailability of PPE, et cetera. Um, when we asked about job satisfaction, a good chunk said it has not changed while, you know, kind of 42 little or less satisfied, but 23 actually felt more satisfied, which was a, a kind of an interesting, um, you, know, you know, kind of um, unexpected. Um, there was a general feeling that other social care was forgotten or blamed, uh, and people were like, uh, really, if, you know, stop blaming us, we try to do the best what we, what, what we could. So summary of finding, there is clear evidence of increased workload, stress, and feeling unsafe since the pandemic. There is reports of decline in general health. Uh, there was differentials definitely by ethnicity, though that we have to look at the numbers with caution. Um, and we've got strong feeling that um, people didn't have enough uh, clear guidance to be safe at work. They didn't have access to PPE uh, and also testing was reported. Uh, even when they had symptoms, they couldn't get tested sometimes. So the concluding remark that obviously um, the, the whole sector and the workforce it started the pandemic under a lot of strain and facing a lot of challenges and the pandemic just significantly increased the challenges. Um, and there was a quite clear differential impact on different parts of the sector. So we didn't have enough time to talk about home care or live-in carers. Um, and there was a strong feeling of being neglected, undervalued. However, if you remained committed, it was 20% uh, reported some increase in job satisfaction. And I think it just, uh, you know, will there be enough of this change to force um, uh, forces to reform social care? Um, maybe, maybe not. Maybe we'll see new models of care. So clearly from this project and from other projects, we are seeing potential growth of living carers. Um, and there are lots of questions about the, um, the provision and the organization and the delivery of care home, um, you know, of care in care homes and their workforce. We will be working more on that topic. So we have, uh, we're planning uh, qualitative interviews and early next year, we're planning uh, a larger survey um, that will not be only online. We're gonna do it in different forms and different modes. Um, and we will follow that with another a survey. So obviously it's a, it's a longitudinal survey. Uh, we're looking forward to, to look at this in detail. So that's it for me. Um, I would be happy to take questions and I put a link to the to the project website. Thank you very much, Shireen. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned living carers and our two uh, next presentations are about the situation of migrant living carers. And they're, they're two separate presentations, but they are linked. And I was really, really pleased to have the offers to speak from both sides. So we've got uh, a research site and then a more, I don't know whether I'd say activist or workers' rights uh, perspective as well. 
So we're going to first hear uh, from from Michael. Uh, let me see if I pronounce it well. This well, Leisinger, uh from Austria. But you're going to actually talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemics on living care workers in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. You've got ten minutes. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, as you already said, I'm talking about the impact the pandemic had on living care workers in Austria, Germany and Switzerland. This paper is currently under review, but you can find an earlier draft of this paper, an earlier version of this paper on ltccovid.org. Um, it wasn't written by just me, but also by my colleagues, Veronika Prila, Karin Schwieter, Jennifer Steiner. Aranka Binaza and Helma Lutz. And the six of us are part of a tri-national research uh, project called Decent Care Work, Transnational Home Care Arrangements. You can see the logos of our universities on here and also our funding. Um, and you can get more information on our project at decentcarework.net. Um, before I'm going to um, the pandemic related impact, I have to talk a little bit about the fragilities of trans uh, transnational living care arrangements. Um, we have uh, transnational, uh, we have living care models in all the three countries in Austria, Germany and Switzerland. They are different legal forms, they are differently institutionalized, but there are similarities. You have mostly female care workers from Central and Eastern European countries like Slovakia, Romania or Poland. You have typically two carers who alternate in rotors of two to 12 weeks. Um, that depends between the three countries. In Austria, it tends to be shorter rotors in uh, Germany. Uh, longer rotors and they commute between their workplaces and their home countries and some of those journeys take up to 30 hours um, per way. Even though it is in the name, I want to stress that um, the living carers not only work in the homes of the care receivers, but also live there during their rotors. Um, as part of the legal forms of employment in Austria, we have almost exclusively self-employed living carers. In Switzerland, we have um, either employment by house Souls or by temporary uh, employment agency who then place um, the carers into households. And in Germany, we have uh, mostly posting of workers under EU uh, legislation. And even before the pandemic, but it increased during the pandemic, um, the role of agency of brokers was already central. When you look at the working and living conditions, and again, that is before the pandemic, um, you can say they are very precarious. You have typically long working hours, low wages, on-call duty almost around the clock, and there's a substantial share of informal or irregular labor. Briefly about um, the methods and data of our paper, it is basically a comparative policy analysis and we looked at the policies and measures between March and June of 2020 and we supplemented that by inquiries with care workers, um, care agencies, unions and activist groups, which we had previously already done research with uh, within our project that is running for over three years. Now to our finding, but findings, what are the impact of the pandemic on living carers? Across the three countries, we can say that the measures primarily serve to safeguard the care provision, so to speak, to have the living care model continue while they subordinated the carers, uh, care workers' wants and needs. Um, also in all three countries, even though differently and some measures might have been uh, stronger in one or the other country, you have three common themes of measures. Um, you have the extension of workers' rotors, you have the re-establishing of transnational mobility, and you have the support for care workers financially affected by the pandemic. Uh, that point, um, Flavia will cover some of that for Austria later on, but generally that was not really on the political agenda. I am going to talk only about the extension of workers' rotors today. Um, if you want to read the other stuff, it's on ltccovid.org. Um, the extension of workers' rotors was done in all three countries. In Switzerland, you had the extension of living carers' work permits by the government. In Austria, we had uh, a governmental one-time tax-free bonus of 500 euros for if care workers extended for at least four weeks. And in Germany, an association of agency, which is a lobby organization that has some uh, political influence, um, they actually tried um, to have the same incentive as in Austria. They weren't successful, but they still pushed in the public. They made a second media um, 
wave where they pushed for that again and stuff like that. So it was on the agenda also in Germany. In all three countries, uh, many living carers extended their rotors and there are some reasons and several reasons for that. Especially in the beginning of the pandemic, um, returning home had become difficult due to travel restrictions. And travel restrictions are not just closed borders, but also, for example, quarantine measures. Um, because if you sp have to spend two weeks in um, government um, supervised uh, quarantine and you typically only go back for three weeks, um, then you wouldn't maybe do that. Um, then they also felt uh, the care workers a moral obligation towards the elderly in their care. They often do the same job for months, sometimes even years. So they know the person and they felt this moral obligation not to leave them in these uncertain times. And this was picked up by the media who portrayed livings as devoted and dedicated heroines. And that's nothing new, um, but this is also something that was uh, retold during that time. Now, extending workers' rotors came with basically two things. They are connected, but still we have them separately. On the one side, you have uh, worsened working conditions. On the other side, you have the additional psychological burdens. Um, the working conditions, for example, were worsened because um, several households limited the visits into the household. So it can be whenever possible that visiting social care or nursing services were limited in how often they visited or maybe put on hold altogether. The same goes along with uh, relatives visits. Um, obviously, these measures were to prevent bringing in um, the virus into the homes, but still um, it gave less opportunity for carers um, to relax, to have a break, because in some cases, like in Switzerland, it's typical that relatives or some other social services provide um, the break that the carers then take, sometimes even half a day, for example, Sundays. Um, in some cases, you had agencies and household require care workers even during the free time to stay in the households. Um, this again was uh, as a measure to prevent bringing in the virus into the homes. So you can say that some living carers were isolated in households for weeks. The additional psychological burden is also twofold. On the one hand, you had the mental health um, of care receivers that was impacted because all of them or most of them are of old age. They're at risk of severe course if they caught the virus, if they caught COVID-19. So that um, impacted the mental health of all care receivers. And on the second hand, in living care settings, we have a lot of um, care receivers with dementia. In Austria, we actually have the statistics. So there are over 40% who are affected by dementia in living care settings and the changes that came in social practices, the changes that came in daily routines negatively affected the mental health of these care receivers. So those two parts together likely put further mental strain on care workers, but that's not the only mental strain that was put on uh, care workers, because they also carried the psychological burden of not knowing when they could travel home, of not knowing when they could see their own families, their own friends, and go back into their own homes. So at least at the beginning, this was also very uncertain, not knowing when to go home, not, go, not knowing when to return. And I'm already coming to the discussion at the blind spots in the current debate. Um, on one hand, um, we had this public um, recognition of the importance of care work and in our three countries also of living care work. But we can say that the measures and the policies, um, this was mostly symbolic and not really done uh, on the point of view of the care workers. The implemented measures ensured that the seniors had their living carers, but the working and living conditions of these uh, living care workers were not on the agenda or mostly not on the agenda, and they became even more precarious in many cases, as I pointed out. Um, even though I didn't cover all the three, but there was a burden put on care workers. The extended rotors with all the downsides are already explained, but there was also if they went on or could go on the journeys, on the, uh, on the travels, there was an additional risk of contagion. They traveled in small shared minibuses, they traveled in uh, trains, in train compartments. So there were um, uh, in, in small numbers even though, and 
some cases they had to wear masks and stuff, but still there were um, this risk if they went on the travel. And sometimes those travels take up to 30 hours. And if they stayed at home, and Flavia, I think, will cover that also after me, um, they often had financial hardships. So the living carers wants and needs in the measures were primarily left unconsidered. And even those measures that were taken, you can say that there were short-term solutions. They didn't acknowledge the fragility or inequality inherent to the living care models. And in Austria, we had recently last week, like two weeks ago, the discussion about uh, Hungary closing its borders again. So there was a discussion again about the transnational mobility. Um, so it wasn't a long-term solution that they looked for even before. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. I have shared the link to your LTC COVID report on the chat. So if anybody would like to find out more, you can link to that. And yeah, we hope to see also uh, a paper coming on that soon. So thank you so much. And now Flavia, uh, you're going to give us a, a, a further perspective into this issue. Thank you so much for joining us. So Flavia is from, and I'm going to say it in English because there's no way I can pronounce the name of it because my German is terrible, but it's an organization representing the interests of living care workers, the initial uh, draft. Uh, thank you so much, Flavia, you've got 10 minutes. You are on mute. Do you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you for inviting me. I am, I think, the only speaker that is not coming from the academia, but uh, from the grassroots movement of um, migrant living cares uh, in Austria. So thank you for having me and thank you for having this input also in your webinar. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm part of the group TREPT. Um, this is a group of Romanian care workers uh, in the live-in system in Austria. Uh, just very shortly, uh, I want to um, mention that uh, this is part of a bigger movement of migrant carers in Austria. So we've joined um, the Slovakian um, group, Initiative 24, and together we're building up a platform to represent all migrant uh, live-in carers in Austria. But within this presentation, I'm going to talk just about the outer group because this is where my work is concentrated on and I have the most experience. So as I said, DREPT is a self-organized interest group for Romanian live-in care workers. Um, our organization uh, exists in this form um, since the beginning of this year, but the founders of uh, my group have been active um, activist carers, let's call them like that, within this community for many years. Uh, so this is uh, a project that arose from this uh, movement. Our group is consisted out of Romanian living care workers and activists such as myself. And together we um, basically fight for better labor rights and better working conditions uh, in Austria. Uh, the word DREPT means right as in human right, but it's also an acronym for the values that we stand for that you also see in the slides. Um, yeah, so as you can imagine, since uh, our community um, is based uh, on live-in carers, um, our um, organization is mainly online. We cannot meet each other in person because every person is in a household with its client. But this works uh, surprisingly well. Um, we are also active uh, offline, so we participate in demonstrations or local initiatives of solidarity. Yeah, and I would like to uh, go into, I would like to, uh, to present you a case study of this Romanian um, um, live-in care community. Michael has already um, brought a lot of details into your attention. I will just make a, a summary. So we have approximately 60,000 uh, migrant care workers uh, in the live-in Austrian care system. And almost all of them are um, migrant workforce from Central or Eastern Europe. The biggest group comes from Romania. It is a feminized work, so um, this brings a lot of extra gender aspects to, um, to this sector. For Romanian living care workers, so you have a better picture of our, our community. Most of the Romanian uh, living care workers travel to Austria, where they work for approximately four weeks. So the normal shift length for Romanian carers is four weeks. After that, they go home to Romania, where they have a break of four weeks, where they spend time with their family, regenerate, recharge. Um, 
during their work in Austria, they are really 24-7 um, on call. So um, also during the night, they have to be available for their client. Um, some of them have lunch breaks of two hours, some of them don't. So it's quite an intensive uh, work um, physically and psychologically. Um, and for this work, they get paid between 40 and 80 hours per day. So per day, not per hour. Um, and divided by 24 hours, that comes to um, a wage of two to three euros per hour. Um, just very briefly, the main issues with the living care system in Austria, the main topic that we as a group and as a movement criticize is the false self-employment. As Michael already mentioned, most of the live-in carers work in the self-employment system that theoretically should bring a lot of advantages such as autonomy and flexibility and all the jazz that self-employment brings with it. But the reality looks very different. In reality, the carers are highly dependent, if not even subordinated to the placement agencies. Um, you see this in the abusive work contracts that they are forced to sign, so they don't have any um, negotiation power um, within these contracts. They cannot uh, negotiate their payments, their working conditions, their working hours, uh, or so on. Uh, the placement agencies undertake these um, tasks and they deliver basically an end result uh, that the carers have to sign. Um, because of the self-employment, they also don't have access to social or labor rights, so they don't have um, benefits such as uh, unemployment support, uh, the right to take sick leave, their wages are not regulated in any way by um, collective uh, uh, negotiations. They don't have access to union representation, um, and therefore they don't. They're not. They're left basically helpless against uh, abuse and exploitation. And this is a um, a central issue in our work. And the last um, topic that I want to address is the language barrier. Um, the Austrian institutions have still problems recognizing that this sector is done by migrants and uh, this comes with certain uh, needs that they have to respond to. And this was very visible during the COVID crisis. So here I come to the COVID crisis. Um, these are just some articles um, that uh, we've gathered. There have been a lot of um, um, news and interviews and so on. They've been called uh, heroes, they've been applauded, but in reality, the Pre pre already precarious conditions that uh, these women and men um, face have gotten even worse during the crisis, um, the problems. Um, so in our experience, there were not so many new issues or new problems that arose, but the present issues that I've addressed um, in the slide before have exploded to a much uh, bigger dimension. What we've done as a group during this time, we've um, translated every possible uh, form um, for subventions or financial state supports uh, that address uh, this sector. So as I said, everything um, in Austria uh, um, that is related to bureaucracy or um, procedures, state procedures is only in German available. So we had to uh, translate everything to ensure access uh, for the carers to these uh, bonuses or subventions. Um, unfortunately, the bonuses that um, um, were offered in Austria reinforced through their procedures this dependency to the um, cared persons or to the agencies. We had two types of um, uh, subventions. One was for the carers that um, due to the closing of the borders were stuck in Austria. It is a 500 euro bonus that Michael also addressed. But the way the procedure to apply for this bonus, although the bonus was aimed at the care workers, the carers could not fill in this form without the contribution of the cared person. So if the cared person or the Austrian family refused to assist uh, uh, the carer, the carer could not access this financial support. And this was a very dangerous weapon um, that was also misused a lot during um, these months in which um, some families uh, abused in the sense that uh, required the carer to prolong its shift and stay two weeks, three weeks, four weeks longer uh, at the workplace. Otherwise, they would not agree to fill in their form. The other subvention was for the carers that due to the closed borders um, got stuck at home in Romania and uh, had no income. Uh, theoretically, this was a very helpful uh, subvention, practically the carers could not access this subvention because one of the conditions was to have an Austrian bank account. 
which they did not have because of the language barrier and could not access from Romania at that time. So this sort of bureaucratic um, obstacles were a default situation during this uh, time of the pandemic, unfortunately, and we are still fighting them even now. Other issues that, uh, that were present in our um, direct experience was the Austria focus protection against um, uh, COVID health risks. So the carers are still up to today requested to bring a negative PCR test in order to enter Austria or to begin their um, um, work here. But in the same time, um, their clients or the families where they are employed do not need to be tested. So the Romanian carers often felt unjustly treated because they had to pay for the test themselves, had to organize all these things. So it was a lot of um, burdens on their shoulders, um, but they were not treated with the same um, uh, protection in return. We had increased pressure and abuse on carers during the pandemic. Uh, the one with the bonus I mentioned before, there was also a lot of pressure from side of the agencies to prolong their um, shifts and um, yes, it went also to extreme cases of threat and threats and, um, and so on. And the last topic, we don't have unfortunately any um, numbers or statistics, but our direct experience um, with uh, our community uh, gave us the impression that the case of domestic violence rose, um, especially against women during this time. Um, and by that we mean not only against women carers, but also against uh, women um, uh, clients, so the, the persons being taken care of. Uh, uh, from their own families. Where we are now, uh, we are further criticizing uh, other bureaucratic measures like the family bonus that uh, for migrant um, families such as the Romanian living carers is being indexed. So they only get half of the bonus that is uh, given in Austria. There has been an initiative now to refund the cost of the PCR test it comes very late. Um, and it's still bureaucratically incredibly difficult to access. And we are participating in the care task um, force of the upcoming care reform that is planned by the Austrian health ministry. What I, however, want to point out is that our mission as a group and as a movement is the annulment of this false self-employment system. And we want to replace it with a standard employment system in order to really obtain um, labor protection and fair labor rights for the, um, my all migrant live in cares in Austria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flavia. And this has been a, an amazing tour. We started with this very broad view of the policies and the conditions of the long-term care workforce from the OECD presentation from Eileen. And now we've gone to this very specific example of how legislation, how our lack of thought really in many care systems about the implications of what looks on, might look on paper like a very cheap solution to getting the right care, or the right the, the cheap care into other countries and it, to, to, to then be able to understand the implication that this has on carers and how a crisis like COVID uh, brings all this, all these bad things we've built into our system to the fore. So that's been a fantastic uh, set of presentations. Thank you all very much. Um, we've already got a few questions that have come up. I think uh, we've got one, um, we've got a comment from Lee Fei, who I think, uh, are you still, I mean, it's really late at night in Australia. So thank you so much for, I think you're still here. Uh, but she was asking about the, um, how much, whether we've seen uh, examples of reductions in care hours in other countries. I know, uh, Shireen, you mentioned that had happened and that seems a bit strange at the time when we've had, uh, so that when in care homes we had so many shortages of carers, on the other hand, we, were, we had potentially people working in domestic home help experiencing reductions in hours. I don't know, Shireen, if you'd like to comment a bit on that. And I don't know if Lise is still here, I can't see now but it's really late, so we won't blame her if she's late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, Evelina. It's, um, it's again, this is part of the differentials by um, the setting. So we did have um, a lot of reports that um, 
family carers, family family members who are the informal carers decided to move in with the fam with the older person to care for, um, and instead of having um, agency care workers. So the, I think these are the situation where you might have that. Um, on the other hand, uh, some living care had to actually to step in. We've got this code that they had to stay. Actually, don't take breaks, don't take weekends um, at all because um, there was a, a you know a fear of the infection and and even the the members of the family didn't visit uh, for a bit of time during the shielding. Um, I'm just going to look at um, you know you know the figures. The figures obviously only 56% reported that they have. Uh, increase their workload. There, are, there were um, there were some percentage. I can't recall the exact percentage, but I think it is um, a significant minority who said that we actually declined, you know, decreased our um, our working um, working hours. Um, but what the point that I want to make as well that when people didn't even increase their workload, sorry, increase their working hour, the workload itself has increased because of um, the number of people in the shifts, number of people doing the same, you know, the usual jobs, so people were taking on more. Um, and actually that was in some care homes who was part of the strategy to control infection, that to keep um, to keep stuff to the minimum um, in reality. So I think there is a differentiation between working hours and work workloads. And we've seen that in the, um, in the survey very much. So we had only 53% saying their working hours has increased, but nearly 80% saying that the workload has increased. Thank you very much. And I know our colleagues who are working on the cross-national uh, report, I know you may want to have a bit of a chance to say a bit more because you, you had a lot of perspectives and countries to cover. So I was wondering if you'd like to talk a little bit more about where you're going with this report and you're thinking about that you will have time to include data and experiences from other countries and, and whether this forum maybe can, can help. I don't know which of you wants to <laughs> come in. Amy, do you want to talk about it or? Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Anna. OK, so we actually we ran a bit out of time, but we had a last slide that we were going to pull up because we've we've also started collect to collect data in the US with help from Courtney. I don't know that she's on the call right now. It's a holiday in the US today. Oh, yes, <laughs> as it is here as well. <laughs> you. Um, but anyways, so um, in the States, just a little bit, uh, there appears to be very little systematic movement in pay for LTC workers during COVID-19. So these top-ups that we spoke about in Canada. Um, we've collected a bit of data on certain states that have implemented something. Um, but so states aside, we're working on that. We've got Australia. And then um, what we're sort of looking for moving forward is we'd like to continue to explore countries that have not introduced incentive payments presently. And is this because workers in LTC are better paid and therefore less likely to hold employment at more than one organization? Um, so we're sort of looking for contrasting countries to what we have so far. So uh, from our understanding, Netherlands would be an example of this um, because the LTC workforce is better paid and therefore less likely to have multiple jobs and therefore we did not need to stabilize this workforce the same way we do in Canada. So we're, we're, we're looking to collaborate with other countries on this project and this paper. Um, so if, if you have examples that you think would pertain to this study, uh, please enter them in the chat box uh, or you can obviously get in touch with Amy. Um, but yeah, what we've presented is very preliminary. So we'd like to do some more comparison globally. Okay. I mean, I know uh, Eileen has looked into this as well. I'd be curious to hear her experience. I know she has only covered one aspect of the policy measures, um, but I, I noticed that there's a, a section on boosting uh, workforce numbers in long-term care as well, Eileen? Yes, there are recruitment measures. So as I said, in countries, and this will actually be more developed in the report that will be published next year, 
um, basically countries, if they're called for volunteers among um, retired workers, among uh, medical students sometimes, among unemployed people, uh, if they were willing to take as uh, a short training, or um, or they called the the army. So that was the policy measures taken for the COVID nineteen as a COVID nineteen response. Uh, but um, just to say that over the last decade, uh, only about half of OECD countries have um, had recruitment efforts. Uh, so basically most countries, like eight countries, recruited from traditional pool, pool and only three countries targeted people beyond um, the, the recruitment pool of, let's say, of, of women, uh, middle-aged women. So only three countries um, tried to recruit men. So um, in other ways, most countries, what most countries do is that they try to provide financial supports uh, for long-term care education to train unemployed um, people and, or caregivers who are willing to, to develop their competences. So these are the basically the type of recruitment efforts that, that exist in, in OECD countries. Thank you very much. And we've got a question from Madalina Rogos. Uh, she says for Michael and Orfari, I think you could ask both, so you could give both a chance to answer. Madalina, would you like to ask yourself? Not I can read it for you. Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for organizing this webinar and thank you all for your presentation. Um, I had a question on, on the responses that countries have and what we could see is that the um, COVID uh, um, restrictions basically looked at countries and, and wanted to safeguard individual countries, right? So governments took action to, to kind of protect uh, citizens or population on, on their respective territories. And the question is whether you are aware or whether you heard or you know of, of uh, European initiatives that would include both sending countries and receiving countries that uh, that aim to, to support live-in uh, care workers. So it's simply an exploratory question, really. <laughs> Thank you. And I think you can both answer, if, uh, Flavia and Michael. <laughs> um, I am not aware of any such initiative. I know that during the pandemic, it was very much um, state government oriented. Um, I know that the Austrian state um, reached out as much as possible to the Romanian state. This collaboration didn't always work very successfully, um, but I don't know of any European initiative that would regulate this, but I do think that this is a European topic, especially because of the mobility of the workforce. The carers from our community, most of them also work in Germany also, or work uh, next month in Switzerland or in Italy. So there is a European level circulation and especially the issue of placement agencies should be regulated at the European level. But I don't know of any clear project that would go in this direction. Maybe Michael, you are better informed than me. Um, I also don't know anything uh, that is directly linked to uh, living care workers and uh, some EU regulation, but I think what the EU um, announced to do or already has done, I, I didn't look into that, is like um, on what levels border closures um, should be done and stuff like that. So there is something into that point and that impacts at least the travel parts for living tech, uh, living care. Uh, um, um, living care workforce, but living care work directly. Um, I don't know any in EU initiatives as well. Just this one point about um, like the uh, the Commission planning to do something about um, border closings. Thank you, and I I'm anxious then maybe go back to Aileen as well because the the issue of migrant carers is also I mean we've also seen it in other parts of the world and it's quite common. Uh, so in the Middle East, or in some countries in the Middle East, in Asia, to have living domestic workers who become effectively carers and who, again, uh, find themselves 
in this situation. I was wondering if the OECD in their work in your workforce, uh, long term care workforce work, you're you're seeing that as a as an emerging issue and an issue as well where better policies may need to be developed. Um, I think that we there is a high share of, of migrants in some countries and not all. And uh, really what's striking is the um, regulation uh, of, of the migration. Because uh, for example, in some countries like Israel, for example, there is a specific uh, legislation that's, that, ch that channels the, the migration of, of the workforce, of, of the workers. Uh, which is absolutely not like in Italy or in Spain, where um, people, the, the, the older people receive cash benefits that they then use, um, or the families receive cash benefits that they use to uh, hire migrants. Um, that's what I can say. That's really, it's not so much the migration, but the type of migration that, that counts um, and that has an impact. Um, would you like would you like do you have a more specific question in mind uh, sorry i was thinking about how it's it's very easy for countries to think of bringing in migrant care workers from other countries to fill in the gaps in and in their care workforce but of course then there are some wider consequences in terms of the, the welfare and the rights of the people who are being employed and the work conditions and the extent to which the, the work conditions are, are mirroring those of the, say, the, the, the resident population. And I was wondering whether this was an issue that what the OECD was seeing some development of, of or improvement of policies in terms of developing better regulation and better uh, policies to, to address the issues. So I think that countries are aware of it. Uh, and they, I, I'm not aware of any uh, new regulation that would be put in place in at least the most countries, uh, most OECD countries. Um, not, no, no, not necessarily. All the more than at the in EU countries, the the migration is also regulated by by the EU. So, so the legislation cannot is is set at the EU level. So um, I don't see any, any I, at least I don't have anything in mind. Thank you very much, Jay. And um, is there any other question for our speakers? Also, if you are one of the speakers and want to ask any of the others, uh, feel free. We've got a few more minutes left. Can I, can I just comment in what you said, just said, Adelina, about the living carers? Because I think um, the, the presentation of Flavia was, was really useful. Uh, and I really liked her call to move from false self-employment to standard employment. And I think this is a growing issue. So um, even in countries where traditionally it hasn't relied heavily on living carers or it's it wasn't a part of the of the usual kind of markets like UK. So I, I, I take it in this point uh, around Spain and Italy and where the cash for care systems might create it routes for um, kind of avenues to 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 make it like migrant in the family and 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 other countries having a different welfare welfare model. But what what is interesting that um, living care has become an option in places where it hasn't been traditionally an option. And I think COVID particularly, because this discussion around COVID will actually make a lot of people to think about living care and 24 seven support as an option um, versus for example, care home or supported living um, as, as COVID will stay with, with us in, in, one, in one form or another for, for a number of years. So um, I, I don't think there are any policy direction, I think, because there is little evidence. And I think the evidence in this area started to grow um, in, in terms of providing evidence on the working conditions and potential exploitation. Uh, and it would be really good to have some higher level attention in terms of uh, policies within, you know, across countries to coordinate uh, some form of um, standardizing. Uh, but what we have seen uh, previously with, with, with cash for care kind of um, kind of 
policy in general that it is um, moving some of the responsibility to the onus on the families and on on the on the you know the the, the older persons themselves uh, and working with agencies they've got a lot of layers and chains in when the the worker starts and where they end um, and while the relationship perhaps between the families and the agency is more formalized then you've got um you know you know you've got the, the worker is having the low share and uh, you know Flavia have uh, provided some really interesting examples and from from the survey as well that living carer was like you know they're saying oh we love lockdown because it's we feel that we're protecting the person that we're caring for more however it means that we basically don't have any personal life we're not able to take um half a day off we're not able to do um anything for ourselves so just just and an, you know you know, interjection about the importance of this area that it's, it's growing. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you're, I mean, does anyone like to respond or add further comments? Now, I've got one further, if not in the meantime, I've got a further question for Aileen. I wanted to ask you if you, if you could share some thoughts as well uh, on avenues to, to further develop the long-term care workforce and try to address some of these issues that have been coming out through COVID. Yes, I, I thank you for this question. Uh, I'm happy because I can uh, talk a bit more about the, in, it allows me to, to speak about the, the main policy areas, this, those four main policy areas. So I've already spoke spoken a bit about uh, recruitment, but I just wanted to say that to improve retention, we have already talked about um, improving pay and for sure it's, it's important, improving wages, uh, improving uh, the number of, maybe increasing the number of hours or reducing depending on, on the, the amount, um, maybe providing more works, uh, more, more um, adapted work schedules. And the last point that I wanted to make is that across OECD countries in general, uh, it, it policies could really strengthen collective bargaining and social dialogue. Because what we see is that because of the form of employment and the small percentage of unions or in the strength of and the, the relatively small um, strength of unions, um, it's very difficult to produce, to have any kind of collective bargaining in this, in the LTC sector. And yet it is a powerful way to, to improve working conditions. Thank you very much. And it is, uh, of course, the creation of groups like the one that Flavia represents and these wider alliances you are bringing that I think are a much needed voice to, to help develop this collecting, uh, collective bargaining, which is already so difficult to start with for any individual workers. So thank you very much. I don't know if we have more questions. We have one or two more minutes, if anybody's very quick, if not going to call it today. We're going to have a few more webinars. It will be again on a sort of every two weeks and we will come back to workforce because there's a, we're aware of a few more projects that are underway. And I am also aware that some of you are continuing to work on your reports and your, and so we'd be very, very happy to hear more about your further findings as your work evolves. So we'll let you know when we have the next workforce team uh, web, webinar so you can come back if you wish to. We'd also be very interested to hear how things evolve with the living uh, migrant workers in Austria and other countries. And as unfortunately it looks like this, this uh, pandemic is with us for a while longer. So uh, thank you very much. We will be sharing the recording. We will be sharing the slides. If any of you of the speakers have any links to any previous work or relevant work you have done, you can also add that to the post that we will do with the recording of the webinar so people can do some further reading on your work or if you want to invite people to contribute and so on, then please let me know. And uh, yeah, so thanks again. And uh, we'll hopefully see you soon uh, to hear more about your work. Thank you.